world, I am Dan Brown, and this is Tech Deck Deck Deck, the only EDH deck building show on YouTube with a finger skateboard that I got in a Happy Meal one time that's ostensibly Star Wars themed, except I uh, grind too much. Anyway, uh, today, oh, we lost the skateboard. This is painful. If I let my hands sweat enough, it will come out. And there, hey, <laughs> how about that? We are talking about progenitus. <laughs> Progenitus is one of the most bonkers creatures ever created. First of all, it's a 10-10 for 10. It's five colors, and uh, it has protection from everything. Like, they printed that on a card. I know, right? Generally, I'm a combo player. I love assembling doomsday devices and winning pretty much out of nowhere. But this deck I built with the idea being uh, that I wanted it to be as fun to play against as is possible. So part of that is telegraphing my win condition from the very beginning of the game, right? At some point, if I'm going to win, I'm going to cast this massive unblockable creature that will kill you in probably two hits. But on our way to hopefully reaching that end game, we're playing a lot of group hug effects that, granted, disproportionately benefit us, right? If I cast some ramp spell that ramps all players, it's going to disproportionately benefit the player with a 10 casting cost commander. Now, often when players build a group hug deck, uh, they're basically rolling over. They're saying from the outset, I have no intention of winning this game. I just want to play, you know, a, a referee role. And there's something noble to that. But in my opinion, Opinion, that makes the game less fun, right? Part of the underlying social contract of any sort of game is that all players are going to try to win. That's what makes it challenging, and the challenge is what makes it fun, right? I don't know that I was necessarily the best player in a game where, you know, I just drew into my win condition because of some opponent's, like, five Howling Mine effects. This deck runs a lot of huggy effects, but we're using them to a, a political end, right? We're controlling the pace of the game. Yes, we want to make sure that all players have plenty of mana, plenty of spells to cast with that mana. We want to make sure that no one leaves the pod feeling like, you know, they didn't have a chance to really play magic. But when the time is right, uh, we, we've built the deck such that we can take advantage of the game state that we have created. So let's get into it. Uh, first of all, I want to show you my mana base. And this is actually, uh, uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm, uh, okay, all right, all right. I believe very strongly, and indeed have learned the hard way a few times, that basic lands are underappreciated in Commander. People, you know, get excited about all these, you know, non-basic rare lands they have and cram them into their decks, when really basics would probably be better. So, uh, part of the reason I built this deck is to prove a point. I want to run the most mana-intensive Commander in existence, and run almost exclusively basic lands. The only exceptions are Reliquary Tower, because we have so many Howling Mine effects that, you know, we want to be able to keep every card that we draw in our hand, um, and then, you know, ways to fetch basic lands. I would run all of the panoramas just if I had them, but I don't. Uh, and beyond that, just basics. And in total, I run 43 lands, which is very high in my opinion, um, but that's for a couple reasons. A, since we're not running non-basics, that sort of compensates, it allows us to fix a little better, and B, our commander costs 10, right? We want to make sure that we are hitting land drops every single turn. This is not a deck where you can, you know, get to 7 mana and then start missing land drops, like, that's not okay. <laughs> Next, I have some just artifact fixing, you know, even if we don't have any particular, you know, type of basic land, we can always hit these, right, to fix our mana. And then the, the huggy effect begin. New frontiers. Each player may search his or her library for up to X basic land cards and put them into play tapped. Casting cost is X and a green. Like, in a Progenitus deck, you can understand why this card benefits you the most, but your opponents don't mind it, obviously, because you're also getting their game going um, very quickly. So I, I love this card. Rights of Flourishing is super cool. Any card that lets you play extra lands on each of your turns is good in a deck that runs 43 lands and has a 10-drop commander. The only downside is that, you know, it also has a Howling Mine effect, and Howling Mine effects um, give your opponents an extra card draw before you. But the flip side there is that if your opponents see you playing group hug effects, they might write you off, and they're liable to use the extra threats they're drawing into against each other, and that's a beautiful thing. And we got Mana Flare and Dictate of Karametra again to get this game started, and also makes casting Progenitus like twice as easy. Um, Howling Mine, this, this is gold standard. Um, Horn of Greed is cool. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, um, it's or whenever.
whenever a player plays a land. There's actually a distinction between um, the terminology there. Horn of Greed only triggers if it's one of your land drops for turn. For example, a fetch land fetching something or a ramp spell will not trigger effects like Horn of Greed. There is a difference between plays and enters the battlefield. Okay, now we have our everyone draws extra cards effects. I guess I showed you a few of those with Howling Mine and Rites of Flourishing, but Well of Ideas, this is kind of like a fixed Howling Mine. It was printed in the blue monocolored commander deck, the most recent one, and it's just, it's really good. It fixes the Howling Mine problem of drawing opponent's cards first insofar as it has an enter the battlefield, draw two cards effect, and also it draws you two cards and opponents only one. But the fact that it draws your opponents one card uh, is probably enough for them to let it stick around. Like they don't care that much about it. It still is helping them, helping them. And the last like mutual hug card I want to share with you, like a group hug card that doesn't discriminate. It treats all opponents equally, right? Is Prosperity. And it's very simple. It's a sorcery, X and a blue. Each player draws X cards. Just make a note of this. We're going to come back to this. We often, when we draw this, want to sandbag it until a very particular moment. And we, we can sometimes leverage this to win the game. So the next chunk of cards I want to feature, um, I call my targeted hug cards. They're not global huggy effects. They're ways to give one particular opponent an advantage that hopefully we can leverage them such that they use that advantage against another one of our opponents and not us. Um, the first is Spectral Searchlight. It's a mana rock that we can use for ourselves, but we also can hold it up and, you know, play politics, give a mana to an opponent. Um, Humble Defector, you've probably seen this card if you've been playing, you know, standard recently. Uh, tap, draw two cards, and target opponent gains control of Humble Defector, which, you know, as long as you're not giving it to the most threatening opponent, um, is a great way to let the table collectively deal with whoever is the biggest threat. Um, Diviner Spirit, I love this card from a political perspective. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, uh, to an opponent, you and that opponent each draw that many cards. So you can effectively say, hey, who wants extra cards? And if more than one opponent wants extra cards, then you can, you can say to them, well, who can make me the better offer. Why should I give you the extra cards instead of, you know, the other player? Um, next we have Perplexing Chimera, which is just, it's very fun, first of all. Any card that gets passed around is fun. <laughs> we can use the Chimera, A, to make sure our threats stick to the board, or B, um, to curry favor with an opponent who's not our primary threat, right? If they play some low impact spell, we say, hey, you want a Chimera instead? And give it to them, and suddenly they like us, and they probably won't swing at us. And finally, the most legendary targeted hug card ever printed, Felda Griff! The, the flying hippo. It's, ah, it's so cute. This deck also runs a few chaos effects because, again, the main goal of this deck is to create a fun game for everyone, and a little bit of chaos is super fun, right? It's novel. It creates a board state that opponents don't get to see every day, so, you know, it makes the game memorable and cool. But be forewarned, there is absolutely a line, and the first iteration of this deck crossed that line. I ran um, Time Sifter and Shared Fate, among a few others. Yeah, they look fun on the surface, but then when you actually play with them Okay, Time Sifter throws turn order out the window, which basically turns the game into a game of chance. And for players who run, you know, low casting cost stuff, they might not get another turn. And nothing is less fun than sitting around watching other people play magic for, you know, sometimes an hour and a half. And then Shared Fate, at a minimum, locks you out of this deck that you spent a lot of time building and are presumably at least a little bit emotionally invested in. And at worst, like, it locks you out of the game entirely because you don't have the mana to cast the spells that you're drawing. <laughs> so I took them out and the deck's better for it and more importantly I'm better for it. I have stopped like losing friends. But the chaos elements that remain um, are Teferi's Puzzle Box. At the beginning of each player's draw step um, they put their hand on the bottom of their library and then draw that many cards. So it, you know, it's chaos. It's crazy. You don't know what's coming up. It's hard to make a game plan but it, it makes the game interesting. And then my favorite card, I, I, I talk about this all the time, Possibility Storm is just so cool. Basically, whenever a player casts a spell from their hand, it is exiled and it instead becomes the next spell in their library that shares a type with it, right? Instant sorcery, creature, enchantment, artifact. Next, I have a card that's in between chaos and my next section, and that is Scrambleverse. I mean, it's absolutely a chaotic card, but it serves a double purpose. It's also 
I like to think of it as a board wipe. Strictly speaking, I know it's not, but in a game of Commander, typically you would want to cast this in similar situations where you would want to cast a board wipe, right? Where one or more opponents have developed their board much more uh, completely than you have. People hate on this card, but I, they're wrong, like, objectively. Nothing is more fun than smacking an opponent down with their own Blightsteel Colossus that randomly got assigned to you. Okay, so those are the general hug, targeted hug, and chaos elements of the deck. They create this loopy board state that in and of itself often throws many opponents off of their game plan. But uh, the rest of this deck um, is basically designed to take advantage of this crazy magic on steroids environment that we have created. The first part of that, which I kind of let slip when I was talking about Scrambleverse, um, is board wipes. Depending on what you consider to be a board wipe, um, this deck runs eight, nine, maybe ten of them. Um, and they're, they're super good in a, a group huggy environment because your opponents have a natural incentive to play the threats that they're drawing because they're drawing so many cards that they just they don't want to have to discard them, right? So they develop big boards, they go after each other with them. If it gets to a point where it looks like maybe they're going to start coming after you, wipe the board and then do it all over again. The goal of this deck, again, is to control the pace of the game and hug effects plus board wipes are one way to do that. Not to mention that ruination in a progenitus deck is just funny, right? Now, even with as many board wipes as this deck runs, you still want to save them as long as possible. Be a little bit conservative with them because the threats your hug effects are enabling your opponents to play might very well go after other opponents and not you. So leave them on the battlefield as long as you can. When they do happen to come at you, we run a bunch of targeted removal also. Between our board wipes and our targeted removal, we are almost always the most prepared player for this roided up game of magic. And I've included a couple other cards in the targeted removal. Um, Baleful Strix is basically like better than a removal spell because opponents will not attack you for multiple turns because you have a death touch with flying out. Um, and Plasm Capture is the only counter spell we run in the deck, but it's just good because it helps us cast a surprise progenitus on the next turn. Now is as good a time as any to mention that we do have a few ways to play extra lands, and the more of these that we have, the better the deck probably gets. If I had an extra Azusa or Exploration, I'd probably put them in here, but, you know, Burgeoning, Oracle of Moldiah, Summer Bloom, uh, we run 43 lands, just natural includes. Next, uh, we have some basic utility cards. Alhamaritz Arc, I don't know how you say that. Uh, it's a <laughs> new mythic from Origins that turns your group hug into a particularly big hug for yourself, right? Um, Clever Impersonator, I mean, just the definition of a utility card. Chromanticor, it's just fun. Put this on a Feldegriff and you're in business. Um, Worm Coil Engine, first of all, synergizes very well with Alhamaritz Archive. And it's also a resilient threat. Um, you still get things after the board wipe. Oh, that's another thing about Chromanticore, right, is after you cast a board wipe, you still have a 4-4 with every keyword ability ever. Fist of Sons, I shouldn't have to explain why this is good. You can pay Wooberg instead of the casting cost for spells, specifically this spell. It mitigates com the commander tax, so even if you've cast Progenitus like five times, it still only costs Wooberg. Conflux for eight mana. You can tutor for one card of every color. It's just Value Town USA. All Suns Dawn, again, in a five color deck, this card is a house. It's a less uh, restrictive casting cost than um, Restock, and it can potentially get you back five cards from your graveyard. Remember when I asked you to take note of this card, Prosperity? Well, now is the time that it's relevant again. Uh, my favorite line of play from any game of Magic ever is, uh, first of all, have like a Mana Flare or Dictate of Karametra on the battlefield, so all players' lands tap for an absurd amount of mana. Now, in the late game, they should have lots of lands anyway, so arbitrary amounts of mana. And then you cast Prosperity for some absurd number of cards, and then you take control of an opponent's turn with Mind Slaver or Worst Fears after giving them all the mana and all of the cards in the world. You can generally, you know, use one opponent's turn to not only suicide themselves, but also take out one or all of the rest of your opponents. If that play comes on the heels of a game where the board has been reset a few times and everyone got lots of mana and lots of cards and a chance to, you know, do the thing that they're does. Like, that is like a, the perfect game of Highlander, in my opinion. Failing that combination, though, we can also win in a few ways with you know, our most obvious win condition, our commander. The awkward thing about the Progenitus plan is on its own, it still takes three swings to knock someone out with commander damage, right? It's only 10, so you go 10, 20, you're one short. It's 
stupid. And because it has protection from everything, you can't enchant it, you can't equip it, you can't target it with a friggin' giant growth. So we do have a few ways to, you know, make Progenitus hit for at least one more. It only takes one extra damage. The first is Jeskai Ascendancy. You just cast a non-creature spell and not only does that pump Progenitus, but it also untaps it. It effectively gives Progenitus vigilance, right, if you have a, an instant. Um, Mirari's Wake is not only good because of the plus one plus one, but also it doubles your mana. It's a one-sided mana flare and it allows you to cast Progenitus twice as quickly. Um, true Conviction. The white, white, white in the casting cost is a little tricky in a five color deck, but again, we're drawing so many cards. We're ramping everyone so aggressively that it's usually not an issue. But because we know this card's in here, if we do, say, have a Bant Panorama or a Terramorphic Expanse, we will often fetch up the planes first. Um, and Silverblade Paladin, fun fact, Soul Bond does not target. So uh, you, you can Soul Bond Progenitus to another creature. So giving it double strike is, you know, 20 unblockable damage, hello. So that's the deck. I have been so happy with how consistently it, it results in fun games. Even when you don't win with it, you still feel awesome after playing it, uh, usually. <laughs> anyway, let me know what you think. Be sure to like the video, um, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, refer your friends and your girlfriends and your grandmother and everyone that you love to check me out and give me money and I'm gonna go play magic now. Okay, bye.